Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Macker's Ramfarley Church, especially welcome if you're visiting with us today and welcome if you're watching the live stream or catching up later. We uh, are encouraged in Psalm 98 to sing a new song to the Lord because he has done marvelous things. He has remembered his love and his faithfulness to Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our Lord. And today, we are rejoicing in God's love afresh. The choir will lead us off into worship by singing the introit. We are going to all join in singing hymn 61, which is Psalm 98, from which I've just read. So hymn 61, oh sing a new song to the Lord. Let us join together in prayer. Lord, we sing a new song, a song of your love that you have revealed throughout history, and especially in sending Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Savior. Jesus, who came to live with us people, approachable, touchable, and real. Honest, direct, and full of wisdom. Jesus, intriguing, challenging, and sometimes infuriating. 
but always full of your Spirit drawing us in. As we gather today, we rely on Jesus' promise that where two or three of us are gathered in his name, he is also with us through his Spirit. So come, Holy Spirit, draw near. Renew and transform us. Take away what is not right, not holy, not honoring to God. Remind us of our baptism, that we have received forgiveness and new life through Jesus' death and resurrection. And help us to live a life fitting to that baptism of water and the Spirit. Open our minds and our hearts as we hear Jesus' words to Nicodemus. May they speak to us directly and shape us. We know that you came not to condemn us, but to love us and invite us into new life everlasting. Speak, O Lord, we are listening. And let us join together in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to hear from John chapter 3 as we journey through John's gospel and hear in the darkness of the night, Nicodemus comes to speak to Jesus. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely you cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light 
and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Amen. May God add his blessing to these readings from his holy word, and his name be the praise and the glory. Thanks, Margaret. We're going to sing another hymn, 755. Be still and know that I am God. Are you a Christian? You may have had this question put to you, perhaps, by someone out evangelizing somewhere in a public space, and if you've paused long enough, then that question may be asked, are you a Christian? It's always a bit tricky to know how to respond to that one, don't you think? Um, because what kind of answer exactly are these people looking for? It would probably not be good enough to say that you tick the box Christian uh, in a population census, because we know there's many more people who tick that box than ever darken the door of a church or even, I guess, look like followers of Christ in any way. And likewise, to answer the question, are you a Christian with, I'm a member of St. Macker's Ronfarley Church, might not entirely satisfy either. Or even, I go to church most Sundays. Because some Christians would not find that a sufficient proof that you are in fact a Christian. In their eyes, it is quite possible to go to church every Sunday, even give financially or time-wise to the church and still not actually be a Christian. In fact, I have been before an interview panel trying to gain access to ministry in the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, having already studied theology and being trained and admitted for ministry in the church in the Netherlands. And really, this question was being asked of me, what... Uh, was my salvation story? Was I actually a Christian? So, you end up wondering, what am I asked to prove here? What do you mean, am I a Christian? And if you're brave enough to ask that out loud, to put that back to the person, you may get the follow-up question, are you a born-again Christian? Or are you saved? What this person is likely looking for is a story or a testimony of a particular kind of conversion experience. For you to be able to say, on this or that day, I gave my life to Jesus. Or I realized 
I was on the wrong path, and I turned to God and accepted Jesus as my Savior on this or that particular time in my life. On that day, I was born again. So, what about it? Do you have such an experience? Could you say when you were born again? What are we to think of such a question? Our, it's usually evangelical Christians right to ask such questions of other Christians, and I'll just put the quotation marks in for now. And are they correct in looking for such a specific answer, such a specific experience? Are we only real Christians if we are born again? And um, what does it mean to say we are born again? Should we be able to give a date and a time for our conversion? Even if, like probably most of you here, have grown up in the church and been surrounded by the faith of others. Well, the conversation that Nicodemus has with Jesus seems to suggest that it is, in fact, a legitimate question to ask, are you born again? Jesus says to Nicodemus, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And then in verse 7, you must be born again. So, there you have it, you and I must be born again. At first glance, it seems that the insistence that you're only a real Christian if you are born again is correct. Jesus puts this challenge to Nicodemus, a respected and respectable Pharisee, an expert in God's laws and scriptures. He's also a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council in Jerusalem that had the authority to deal with all the religious, civil, and cultural affairs of the Jews. So if this is how Jesus challenges Nicodemus, if he, with all his Jewish religious credentials, cannot assume to have a part in God's kingdom or access to eternal life, then surely it is right for you and I to ask ourselves or each other if we are in fact born again. But maybe like Nicodemus, you want to ask, well, what does it actually mean to be born again? And one way this may be helpful to understand is that in the Greek, this word used for again is the same as from above. So Jesus is saying, are you born from above? Clearly, we can't physically be born twice, as Nicodemus points out. Jesus talks about needing to be born from water and spirit, but that is really still as clear as mud, isn't it? What does Jesus mean? He's likely referring to the experience of baptism. We know already, you know, in chapter 2, John is baptizing people of baptism of repentance, but says, someone will come after me, you will baptize you with the Holy, with fire and with the Spirit. So there's the link, the water, water of baptism and the fire, the Spirit that Jesus is going to pour out and give to his disciples. These two things are the being born from above or being born again event that Jesus is referring to. Anyone who believed that Jesus was in fact the Messiah sent from God and wanted to follow him would need to be baptized in water. Baptism was and is a sign of repentance, of laying off the old life and coming up out of the water as a new creation. Reborn, we might say. But the unique gift of Jesus is the Holy Spirit. As it was promised in the Old Testament, a time would come where God's people would be given a new heart and a new spirit that would actually enable them to live in the way that God wanted. God's law that he had given to his people on its own was good, it was grace that he'd given this, but time and again it was clear that they couldn't truly keep God's commandments, that their hearts weren't in it. 
And then the prophets had prophesied that a time would come where God would give them a new heart and a new spirit and they would fully be able to live in the way that God wanted. For example, in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25 to 27, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So God himself is bringing about this heart change in people. And this time has now come. Jesus, as he has arrived, brings with him this time of the Spirit, this time where people will truly turn to God. And anyone who wanted to be truly part of God's people now had to be born again or born from above by water and Spirit. And he's really putting it to Nicodemus that Nicodemus should understand this. He knew these prophecies about the Spirit. Of course, it would be a challenge to Nicodemus. He could no longer rely on his learnedness, his status, his credentials. If he, Nicodemus, wanted to keep up with God, he needed to be ready and open to the Spirit. He needed to listen to Jesus and accept his authority as the one coming from God in heaven. And some of the conversation which we can't even fully unpack today, is about Jesus' authority as the one who's coming from heaven. But Nicodemus needs to be prepared to humble himself and be baptized as a sign of repentance and new life. Go into those waters of the Jordan River alongside any old sinner. That's the gauntlet that Jesus throws down to Nicodemus. You must be born from above. Well, that is a challenging and a disconcerting message to swallow. We don't know if Nicodemus, you know, followed that up. It doesn't look like it, at least not in the immediate time later. He comes back twice more in John's gospel, where once he pipes up kind of in support of Jesus in the Sanhedrin when they're trying to work out what to do with Jesus. And after Jesus' death, he is alongside um, Simon when uh, they bury uh, him in the garden. But it, it remains a bit of a question mark, you know, if that's an evidence of, of full discipleship or if he stayed slightly on the fence. But I'd like to think that he's kept up with Jesus and hasn't, uh, hasn't turned away. But anyway, this challenging conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus uh, perhaps shows that the evangelicals are right to query us, churchgoers, whether we are in fact born again. But you and I might still wonder how we answer such a question. I sort of struggled with it when it was put to me by the, um, the panel that was interviewing me. Yes, I am a Christian, but no, I didn't have any particular date or time for them to tell them some wonderful experience when I first was born again. Do we need to have such a special experience, a clear before and after, a date and a time? You might have, because for some people that clearly is the case. They knew, you know, they had left God and religion behind or never had it in the first place and then had an encounter with the gospel, with Jesus' challenge to come and follow him and they knew they had to make up their mind and surrender themselves to Jesus. And there was a particular moment in their life that they can refer back to. And that's very powerful and it can be something to you know, lean on later in life as you, as you journey with Christ. But I assume, and I think for many of us, if you have been brought up with the faith in a Christian family, um, coming to church, youth fellowship, whatever it may have been, then like me, you may not be able to pinpoint any particular date or time 
when you were born again because you can't think of a time where you wouldn't have said, yes, I love Christ, and yes, I want to follow him. And perhaps like me, there have been times where you've kind of drifted from the path or been more lukewarm, and you know, other times where you've been more zealous and enthusiastic, but if anyone had asked you, are you with me? Uh, if Christ had asked you, are you with me? You would have said, yes, here I am. So, what about that then? Does that count? Are you then still a born again, born from above Christian? Tom Wright, in his book, John for Everyone, has a helpful illustration. He writes about being unable to find his birth certificate due, due to a number of house moves, and obviously this was a bit of a nuisance because for certain legalities you do need to produce your birth certificate. And if he really needed it, he would have to go back to the council where he was born and ask for a fresh copy of his birth certificate. But not having a birth certificate obviously doesn't make him or anyone else question where, whether he was actually ever born. Because, you know, he's there, he's alive. Of course he was born somewhere, some time ago. When Jesus says that we need to be born from above, it doesn't mean we need to be able to produce a birth certificate with time and place. When and where, or even how we became born from above, ultimately isn't what matters in Jesus' challenge to Nicodemus and to us. It's not about the time and the place, it's about now. Who are we? What matters is whether we are born from above, whether we are born by water and the Spirit, and whether we live by Christ's Spirit. If we are born from above, it will be clear who we put our trust in. Is that Jesus, or is that our own credentials or status or activities or whatever else we think we can bring to the table? Do we trust in Jesus as our Savior? And what matters is not if we had some one-off spiritual experience in the past, even though it could be helpful and a source of strength for us, what matters is if we are led by God's Spirit now. Let's put it another way. Sometimes I find it helpful not to ask, am I or are you a Christian? But Am I, are you, following Christ? Rather than a static label we could put on ourselves or on others, are we following Christ? The first Christians got their name from other people around them in Antioch. They called the followers of the way, the followers of Jesus' way, Christians, because their lives looked like those of Christ and they were full of the message and the good news of Christ. Are we following Christ? That really is the main question to ask. And if I am, or if I have drifted away, and really I'm just doing my own thing, then I need to turn back to Christ again, start following again. And that is a question for all of us, and it keeps coming back on our discipleship journey. Are we following? Are we with Christ? And do we put our trust in Christ? Is His Spirit leading us forward? If you know you're not, if there is still something holding you back from surrendering to Jesus, then now is the time to do so. He came to bring us life. And if you have drifted from the path, then turn back. Be born from above. Jesus is there leading us on. Amen. The choir will sing the anthem.
respond by singing Just As I Am Without One Plea by Five Three. I'm sad to share with you today that on Thursday the 20th, uh, Alec Bullen died peacefully at home, and his funeral will be on uh, Friday the 4th of February at quarter past 11 here in the church. Uh, I would also ask you to remember the family of Maureen Steele, whose funeral was held on Friday. Let us pray. Birthing God, you gave us new life when we were born of water and spirit. Help us live into that new life, refreshed and renewed for your work. Amen. Jesus, if you know that this conversation you had with Nicodemus could have been us, curious but sitting on the fence, perhaps puzzled and holding back. If we feel today convicted that actually we know we are not born from above, that this call, this invitation goes out to us. Help us across the threshold. Help us to put our faith in you fully, without reserve. Help us to put our pride aside our shame aside and trust in you for our salvation and each day of our life. Recreate us through water and the Spirit and lead us into the life everlasting. At the beginning of this new week, we pray for those who are coming to terms with a new reality, with fresh bereavement, with news of terminal illness, with uncertainty and pain. 
Lord, in your mercy, give strength and light. We pray for our country, for people concerned and impacted by the high inflation, the price of groceries and fuel and heating. We pray for food banks and other charities who help and for wise decisions on the part of governments so they will know how best to respond. We pray that we may all be generous in our thoughts and actions. Lord, in your mercy, give strength and light. We pray for the world, for the people of Tonga dealing with the aftermath of the volcano eruption, and we pray for the escalation in Ukraine. We pray for the countries where Christians and other religious minorities are persecuted. Lord, in your mercy, give strength and light. We pray for ourselves and those who are on our minds and hearts today in the silence. Lord, in your mercy, give strength and light. Amen. We are going to sing hymn 526. This is a day of new beginnings. from here with the blessing of God who makes new beginnings all the time, also for you. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.